have the other questions, you can summarize them. We have a lot of good questions about the JCPOA, about the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the Iran nuclear deal. Um, and they, they, they're coming from a range of different perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, they include um, questions about whether or not the United States can re-engage Iran and the G JCPOA uh, based on um, what Iranian foreign policy objectives might be. Uh, there are questions about whether or not it's appropriate for the United States to engage on the nuclear question without uh, discussing other issues such as hostage taking and, and uh, human rights issues. Um, there's also a question about whether or not the United States can um, potentially negotiate the nuclear question while also either easing sanctions or uh, contributing to some type of broader relief effort on COVID if it's not a complete release of the sanctions. So uh, I guess I'm just summarizing the, the questions we have about the JCPOA and I'm wondering what um, you think the best way forward is for uh, reviving that and addressing all the other strategic concerns on the notepad. Well, let, let me, uh, first of all, I, I like to call it the nuclear agreement. I, I, I don't call it the deal because the deal to me um, reminds me of buying a used car. You, know, you make a deal over a used car, but not, uh, th th this I put on a higher, uh, 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 a higher level. Um, let me just say a couple of things uh, um, about it. Uh, is this, um, from the from the American point of view, you know, is this a perfect agreement? Um, of course, it's not, because it is a it's a negotiation, and you know, in negotiate in a negotiation between parties, you don't get everything that you want. The only way you get everything you want is if you bully the other person or force the other person um, into submission. But that's not negotiate. Uh, that's that's not negotiation. Um, are there things that we did not uh, are not in this negotiation um, that would be good to negotiate? Of course, you mentioned you mentioned prisoners, hostage take uh, 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 hostage taking. You could mention some other things, um, but the decision. At the time, and I think I think it was a good one, was to say, look, um, if you negotiate everything, you agree on nothing. Um, let's find what we can agree on. Now, I mentioned I mentioned being wrong a lot uh, about Iran, and I was wrong again here back in uh, two thousand nine, two thousand ten, the beginning of the. Um, first Obama administration, um, I didn't think we would ever reach an agreement on the nuclear issue. I thought it was too, I thought it was too hard. I mean, it seemed to me that what we wanted, the Iranians could not give and what the Iranians wanted, we could not give. Uh, well, I was wrong. I think there were some reasons for the, for the change. There was the change of administration in Iran, uh, um, in Iran, which made a difference. And then there were some concessions on the American side as well, I believe about enrichment, uh, uh, about enrichment um, which, changed the, uh, which changed things. Uh, and I know they tell you in uh, uh, negotiation school that you're supposed to separate the person from the problem. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, when, Ahmadinejad, when Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was president, it was very difficult from the American side uh, to negotiate about anything. Uh, because because of him, some of his statements and his comments, uh, he had become, if you excuse the expression, he become radioactive in Washington. I mean, you you just couldn't deal with him, whether he whether he was speaking sense or whether he was speaking nonsense. It didn't matter. Uh, people were not listening. It stopped. Uh, uh, it stopped listening to him. Um, now the other the other point. I mean, there, we could talk all day about. It. The, the, the JCPOA, but I'll, I'll make just one last one last comment, uh, and maybe there are going to be more questions. But what struck me about this was back when this was being debated in 
2015, 2016, that, peri uh, uh, that period, um, the degree of mirror imaging that you saw, that the terms of the debate in Washington and in Tehran were very similar. Uh, what did you hear in Washington you, uh, or in the US? You heard, oh, um, how can you make any agreement, any agreement? They were not talking about the nuclear agreement. They were talking about you know, uh, part five, paragraph two, subsection one. They were not talking about that. They were talking about how can you make any agreement with people like that, with people who do things like that. And they were talking about support of terrorism, the human rights, uh, the hostage crisis of '79, and so forth and so on. How can you how, how can you do that? And then they would say um, this agreement is worse than Munich. This is worse than the. Uh, the surrender, the Allied surrender, uh, appeasement of Hitler at Munich in 1938. Okay, go to the Iranian side and then you watch, you listen to the debates uh, there and it was the same sort of thing. How can you make an agreement with people like that who do things like that? And you could point to the coup of 1953, you could point down to the shooting of the, shooting down of the Iranian airliner, you uh, point to supporting Saddam in the Iran-Iraq war and so forth and so, uh, 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 economic uh, sanctions. You could you could point to all of uh, all of these things, and then they would say, uh, "This this is uh, agreement is worse than the agreement of Turkmenchai." Uh, now, um, Batman, Matthew, you both know what Turkmenchai is. Uh, probably most of our audience does, but if you ask most American audiences, they think Turkmen chai is something you get at Starbucks. <laughs> and they have no idea what it is. But my God, every Iranian knows what it is. And um, again, this was the this was the mirror image. And what struck me is the similarity of the opposition um, on both sides. And we were side, but neither side was talking about. Uh, the actual content um, of the agreement. Great. There are questions about the domestic tensions in both the United States and Iran that make diplomacy so difficult. Um, on, I'll ask kind of two sets of questions, I guess, two, two questions really. Um, one is, how can the U.S. government and the new administration open up a dialogue uh, without, you know, being tagged as um, any as being any number of bad things by uh, the political opponents in the United States? So, in a heightened, uh, you know, the U.S. is in a very uh, difficult, tense, and volatile position right now. So, how do how does a new administration? Um, kind of communicate what it wants to do with Iran to a population that maybe is thinking about a range of other issues or finding their information from a range of different sources. Um, and then even communicating perhaps to Americans kind of old principles about non-intervention in other countries' affairs as uh, being uh, kind of a staple in U.S. foreign policy and a, a reason why we may have uh, kind of limited negotiating um, aims or objectives with Iran moving forward. Uh, on the other hand, there's a, there are a lot of good questions about the upcoming Iranian elections and um, the, you know, the, the, the nature of the leadership you described in your um, talk. So I would just ask, um, given that we have you know, no ruse holidays and an election season in Iran after um, that coming up in April, uh, May, June, and, you know, um, how can the Biden administration engage Iran in a timely manner uh, without uh, kind of making a, a candidate in Iran's position on the United States a political football in Iran? So how can the Biden administration ultimately balance a really tense political situation at home with uh, leadership considerations and uh, elections in Iran? Well, if I had 
if I had the Matt, if I had answers to those questions, um, I'd, I'd probably be Secretary of State, or at least, uh, um, boy. For one thing, I guess the first thing is know the limitations of what you can and cannot do. Uh, I mean, we cannot control um, Iran's political culture. We cannot control the way developments are going to go there. We have to realize. I mean, you you pointed out the uh, uh, the upcoming Iranian. Uh, uh, elections. Um, nobody said this was going to be easy. Uh, this is going, you know, this obviously, this obviously means uh, to quote again, everything is to quote uh, uh, Ryan Crocker, everything's harder than you think. This is going to, this is, this is going to be hard. Um, and I've seen commentary that said, oh, no, no, we can get right back into the, into the, uh, into the nuclear agreement. I'm not sure that we can. I'm not, I'm not sure that we can. This may take some, you know, the, this may take some doing, uh, because so much mistrust, so much mistrust, so much, uh, so, so much suspicion um, has been has been built up on both uh, um, on both sides. Uh, you know how how do you you know how do you do this? Well, again, uh, you can choose. You know, you can convey it uh, you can convey a desire through public statements um, through intermediaries through you know through back uh, 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 back channel you can choose your I mean I'm very very happy to see for example um, uh, ambassador burns uh, named as uh, Bill burns as uh, head of the uh, head of the CIA and others um, and uh, Wendy Sherman in the Department of State. I mean, these people with experience in uh, um, uh, um, in this field, and you know, they're not coming to the, they're, they're not coming to this uh, not coming to this new. Uh, but I would uh, the thing I would note. I mean, you talk about uh, <clears throat> talk about domestic uh, uh, dom domestic politics. I mean, um, look at what we had. Uh, last week, look what we had last uh, uh, um, last Wednesday. Um, I watched that, and it was Tehran all over again. It was Tehran 1979, uh, where a mob invades a space that's supposed to be inviolable. The American Embassy in 79, the capital, U.S. Capitol in in, uh, in 2020, uh, 2021. Um, it was. Uh, and then the question was: Then there's the security is completely inadequate; it gets brushed aside. Um, calls for help um, are not answered, or are answered late, answered too uh, uh, too late. And most chilling is that the action is um, incited and endorsed by each country's supreme leader. Uh, and there it is. Uh, uh, it's out there. Uh, so I, uh, point being that uh, we're dealing, you know, whatever we do, we're dealing, this is, is going to be a situation of great delicacy. Um, and we're going to have to choose our, you know, we have to choose our words carefully. Um, we're going to have to move carefully. Uh, to, to move carefully, and you know the 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 new administration's got lots of things on its plate. I don't know if this is the first you know the, 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 its first priority or not. Uh, probably not. Uh, uh, probably not. Uh, but a lot of people, I notice a lot of people from um, Henry Kissinger to Dennis Ross to others are are giving this new administration lots of advice. Um, on what it should do, on on what it should do, um, in terms of you know sort of the U.S. part of it, um, I can remember being in when I was came came out of uh, teaching, came out of retirement to work back in the first Obama administration on Iranian affairs, and we would sit in meetings and people would say, well, we what about this initiative? What about that initiative? We could talk about this. We could talk about that. And the response so often was, uh, well, if we do that, yes, we could do that. But if we do it, we risk looking weak. 
we've got to look tough. And to me, uh, tough is overrated. Um, I like smart. And I mean, you know, the Huns, the Huns were tough. Uh, the Visigoths were tough, you know, who remembers them except for, you know, rape and pillage. Um, let's try, you know, try something a little different. Let's try smart and maybe not worry so much um, about appearing tough. Uh, I'd just jump in to, you preempted a few questions, one about how the experience of the revolution and the late 70s can help us reflect on our own unfolding history and today. And um, so you, you read somebody's mind, uh, Lawrence Wilkerson's mind on that question. Um, there, there are a couple questions that are about the, the Biden team um, that maybe you can uh, build on. And um, the questions go something like this. What can we expect from the incoming Biden administration? What are their views uh, on Iran? Can we expect uh, something new, or will it be a kind of Obama redux? Um, and I would just add to that in your opening remarks, you mentioned all of the uh, strategies that different administrations have pursued, dual containment, axis of evil, maximum pressure. Uh, but one that you didn't include was contagement. I borrow from the historian Doug Little, who describes Obama's policy toward Iran as in th these terms. Um, do you think that's fair? Uh, contagement, a way to characterize the Obama administration's policy, a kind of mix of engagement and containment. Um, and do you think that's what we can expect uh, moving forward or will there be something different? Okay. Um, well, let me, let, me be, let me be very, very blunt here. I mean, there are, there are you're, you're right. A lot of people in the new administration, it appears have come you know, back from the Obama administration, but those I know, and those I know by reputation, I, I, um, I think very highly of. And they're, they're experienced and they, they believe, as far as I can tell, from my experience, they believe in the process of diplomacy. You know, they believe there is something called diplomacy that works. Um, and we have not seen that in the last four years. I mean, it, it should be it, it would probably seem uh, obvious to most of our audience, but uh, to or to all of the audience, uh, but it hasn't been it, it hasn't been there. And I think the JCPOA is a good example of just you know what you you know how diplomacy can work to achieve a goal to uh, uh, to achieve a goal. In this case, limiting a nuclear, another country's nuclear wep uh, um, nuclear weapons program. Uh, you know, what will, you know, what will they do? Um, how will they do? I mean, first of all, let me, let me just be very blunt. Uh, whatever we get has, has got to be better than what we've had. I mean, you know, look at what we've, uh, look at what we've had for the last four years, for the, for the last four years. Um, a, a few year, a few months ago, I was on a TV program, um, and the moderator referred to um, a certain Secretary of State and as his top Iran person as top American diplomats. Well, I'm sorry, uh, I took great exception to that. Uh, whatever they are, uh, these worthy gentlemen are. They are not diplomats. Uh, I mean, I. I can't say I was a diplomat, but I practiced it and I was around it for a long time, for 30 some years, um, and I know it when I see it. Uh, and this is, this what they practiced uh, was not, it was not diplomacy. It was sort of sometimes sermonizing, sometimes, sometimes uh, bullying, sometimes uh, posturing. So I, th I, I, I'm confident, I think, uh, you know, I mean, you can criticize this decision or that decision, say, well, you maybe should do this a little different or do something else. But um, I think this group, what this group is going to do um, is sort of go back into the garage um, and find a box of uh, rusty tools 
uh, you know, rusty tools of diplomacy that haven't been used for about four years. Uh, get them out and uh, polish them up, maybe oil them, oil them up. Um, and to everyone's surprise, it will, they will probably find out uh, that they work. Um, and, you know, better than posturing, giving them um, ultimatums, um, you know, or claiming that your own policy uh, works uh, without any particular without any particular evidence. I mean, um, all all of these things. Um, you know, we we've got to get something better, and I think we have. I think we have. I mean, what I've at least what I've seen or what I've heard uh, makes me very optimistic. Very good. Let me give a break to Matt and well, I'll follow up with this question, John. Uh, one participant has asked engagement with religious leaders of gravitas in Iran was supported silently by both the Bush and Obama administration. It provided for deep engagements in Iran and the US that also led for easing of visa restrictions that eventually allowed for the sharing of academics, artists, and some civil society leaders. There have been also the opportunity to work with Iran and the US for the freeing of prisoners, hostages on both sides. What role do you see that religious engagement can play now as we work with a new administration in Washington and the new Iranian president in June? Okay, uh, that's a good question. I mean, it, it, it's not just, there, there's a whole range of engagement that one can, one can do when you talk about um, an engagement uh, between religious scholars, um, engagement, of uh, uh, Bahman, you've been involved with the with exchanges of athletes, um, other, other kinds of exchanges, artists, filmmake uh, um, artists, um, uh, filmmakers, medical person, uh, 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 medical personnel. Um, I, you know, these are these are these are very good things, but they've been going on for a long time, um, and so far, at least, it's been very hard to actually break through into anything beyond what they're, in other words, uh, ping pong diplomacy in China was followed by President Nixon's visit. Um, it was followed by a real change of relationships. Um, in the case of Iran, um, uh, it hasn't been, uh, at least not so far. Not to say that these, aren't, these things aren't, worth, aren't, aren't worthwhile, uh, because they are. I mean, you have to you have to take sort of any kind of connection, uh, any kind of co uh, connection that you can. Um, but so far, so far at least, they have, you know, I'd like to say, well, where have these things led? Where uh, um, uh, where have these things led? Uh, but you know, eventually, you want to get. Let me make one more point about these exchange the, the, these exchanges, um, and this is. This is something tricky, but I think it's worth thinking about. It's worth thinking about. Um, exchanges that involve one country, involve the United States, um, how would I say this? Teaching the Iranians how to do something, giving benefits of, I don't know, superior technology or whatever it is uh, uh, to the Iranians. Uh, in my experience, uh, are not always are not very productive, because what they do, consciously or not, maybe with the best will in the world, uh, they reinforce a tradition of um, giver and receiver, um, receive uh, donator and supplicant, donator um, and supplicant, a little bit like the foreign ministry gentleman and my offer to help with his, uh, with his, with, with the traveler. No, we don't want your help. We don't, we don't want your help. We don't need your help. We, we don't need your help. Um, and so what we need to do, and this is, this is difficult, but it's not impossible. It's to figure out a way that in fact, um, in fact, uh, how do both sides benefit? Where's the, where, what areas for, in what areas, for example, do the Iranian do, does the Iranian side have something to offer uh, the American side? And there are areas like as in health, 
one area I, I once suggested, and I, I got some really strange looks when I said this, was um, uh, dealing with casualties of chemical warfare. Uh, because back in the Iran-Iraq war, when the chemical, when they, the Iranian side first dealt with uh, the casualties of chemical warfare, they found that the literature was dated from 1916. It was all for the First World War. It was all from the First World War. Well, there's now a literature and an experience among Iranians that don't have. Who knows? I mean, God forbid that there should be such an event in the United in, 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 the, in the United States or elsewhere. But if it were there, that would be something uh, that that might be something of it, uh, of interest or other other areas like this. But somehow you have to break the pattern of um, recipient uh, of donate donor and recipient because with that immediately comes the implication of superior to inferior uh, 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 superior to inferior. Uh, I'm not sure how you do this. Um, as one person said uh, to me, he said, they, I, I heard a, someone comment, they said, it's, my, it's like making the rain fall up. <laughs> uh, but that's the way you have, you know, that you have to sort of keep that in mind when you have these, pro, uh, 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 when you have these programs. I don't know, you know, we do get together over things. I mean, the idea of, of the, I think you, you've been involved with wrestling Mm -hmm. um, in the past, um, I, I, I recall, wasn't it, when at one point when the Olympic, when the Olympic Committee wanted to remove wrestling from, from the Olympics, um, and the U.S. and the Iranians, uh, we got you not we presented a united front in opposition, <laughs> in, in opposition. Probably the first and only time in the last forty years that such a thing has happened. It doesn't happen. But it was it was an argument that. Uh, to reach a, a better understanding between Iran and United States, we have to inform both Iranian population and American population about some of the initiatives that is taking place. So our goal with wrestling was that we want to go beyond the expertise to expert relationship and bring the interactions on the community level. As you know, wrestling is a sport that is supported by many conservatives in this country, state of Iowa. Utah, Idaho, Oklahoma, Texas. That's where some of the American wrestlers come from. And Iranian wrestlers also came from many, many of those conservative provinces, Mazandaran, Gilan, Kurdistan. So our goal was kind of open it up more through the nation to nation, rather than kind of a, becoming a very much of an expert to expert. So I recall bringing the American Iranian wrestlers to Iran, to America, we had a hard time filling out the consul's uh, visa applications for them because they came from small villages in Iran. They really didn't have an exact address. They didn't have email. They didn't have a mobile phone. So uh, in a way, it kind of hit at us that exchanges with Iran must be multi-layered, must be multi-level. And the more Iranian society is so pro-American today, but American society, unfortunately, harbors many anti-Iranian feeling. So, isn't, isn't, the, uh, isn't the wrestling in Iran also related to the culture of the Zurkhane? Yes. Yes, it is. I mean, and, deep, that goes sort of deep into the society. That goes really deep. deep. Into and also, if you look, many of the diplomatic link, lexicons in Iran used by Iranian supreme leader refer to wrestling. Right. He, during the JCPOA negotiations, he called it heroic uh, flexibility. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, I think kind of a, we need to really refine in, in, uh, in answer to one of the questions of religious leaders. I think those are all good, as you mentioned, but we need to figure out a way of expanding those areas of engagements. And I think by expanding it more, we kind of benefit both sides. Uh, mm -hmm in a way. So but maybe that's, you have more observations on that. I would, two really important points came up and I'm glad that they did. One is the issue of visas. It seems to me that visas and multiple re-entry visas and 
kind of various ways to make the free flow of people a bit easier um, could could do as much as any other um, initiative. And I was also happy to hear this question of kind of equal footing and partnership. Uh, the U.S. removed its aid mission from Iran in 1967, and ever since there, um, you know, is a, a move from this patron-client Cold War relationship to a partnership or some type of relationship between uh, equals. So the conversation of how to establish reciprocity and the relationship, whether diplomatically or culturally, is a is a long go, long-running conversation. I have seen in the documents that. In the mid 70s, as the U.S. was pulling back its public diplomacy budget and the Iranian government was bringing in a lot of uh, oil money, that it was a big deal when uh, Iran was paying kind of for the majority of the exchanges of the of the mid 70s. And um, it was acknowledged by people at the time as a major step toward establishing some type of evil play, uh, equal playing field, like you described. Um, um, I, I would just kind of interject with uh, one more a uh, question that I, I see a lot of people are asking in different ways, and it essentially goes like this. Um, um, the, the point is taken about messaging and how to communicate um, an interest in dialogue and the various layers of communication and exchange that are needed. Um, but um, people are wondering how we get to the uh, Nixon and China moment or what happens in Carter, where you actually have a Democratic president follow through on a Republican administration's policy initiative, which is uh, kind of fully normalized relations and, and open the embassies. Um, how do we get there? Do we build on personal ties that were established between people like John Kerry and various Iranian diplomats um, during the previous negotiation? Um, will it come through, you know, very quiet back channel negotiations like we had uh, during the early years of the nuclear diplomacy in third countries, um, if we don't want uh, the conversation to be housed in the Defense Department or the Treasury Department, um, where is the conversation ultimately housed if it were to get to a formal level? Is it a State Department initiative, or do you see other um, agencies being able to play a proactive role in a way that maybe some of the more high-profile agencies wouldn't uh, be able to. So I guess the question is, how do we get from ping pong diplomacy to normalization, but in the uh, Iranian American context, as opposed to the Sino-American context? Yeah. Again, uh, I I could begin to answer that in terms of you know, how you know where it goes or how it goes because we're not there. I mean, we're not there yet. Uh, we need to be able to sort of. I mean, that was part of the. I think that was part of the uh, attraction of the nuclear agreement, uh, not for the nuclear agreement, but that it established a different way of talking to each other. Um, I mean, to give you an example, the nuclear agreement uh, contained arrangements for follow-up um, at um, level under that of secretary, the secretary, minister, uh, uh, ministers, so that uh, Secretary Muniz and Secretary Kerry, uh, along with uh, the uh, Foreign Minister Zarif uh, and Dr. Salehi, you know, were the figures at the top. But more more telling uh, was the kind of uh, communications that followed it. Uh, that people at a lower level throughout the U.S. government, and some in the State Department, and some elsewhere. Um, we're talking to each other by email directly. Um, this was about, you know, this was after maybe 2014, 15, 15, 16, and so forth. Um, they were um, talking in a way that if I had tried, to, if I had done that in, say, 2009, back in, or 2010, um, I would have had the FBI at my door. Um, it was just not possible then. Um, and sort of the idea being that, okay, you can, you, we can achieve a goal uh, in the Iranian case, an easing of sanctions in the American case, limiting the nuclear, uh, the lim limiting a nuclear program, um, not by beating our chest uh, or not by sermonizing or not, not by 
uh, bullying the other side, but by negotiate by negotiation in a different in a, um, um, in a different way. Now, you know how you have a breakthrough. You know, it could. I, I wouldn't even begin to predict. I wouldn't even begin to predict. It could, it could come through. You know, an intermediate, uh, um, uh, an intermediary. The breakthrough that got us out of Tehran in 1981, after Khomeini had said, "No, you can't. We know we can't talk to any American officials," um, came through the Germans, and then the Algeria, uh, 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 and then the Algerians. Uh, in the case of the nuclear agreement, it was the Omanis who paid, who uh, um, uh, who played a role, um, and so uh, um, and and so forth. You know, could it be um, uh, Secretary Kerry and his uh, u- using his connections, the experience that he gained, or or someone else in the in the, in the administration who is uh, who has con- you know who enjoys confidence. On the other side, and the same way on the uh, uh, on the Iranian side. At one point, I heard uh, uh, within the uh, uh, within the, the uh, Trump administration the idea of uh, having Rand Paul as a kind of intermediary. Interesting idea. It seemed a very interesting idea to me, given some of his statements on relations with Iran. Uh, uh, relations with Iran. Uh, you know, but again, there has to be kind of an, uh, uh, an openness to to listening um, and saying, okay, uh, we'll, if, if we don't, uh, you know, if a door, if, if the door shuts, we'll try the window. Um, and if this doesn't work, we'll, you know, try something else, but not, again, going back to the uh, sort of original principle was to uh, uh, patience, to keep it, to keep it up, having the idea that, no, we want to change, you know, we want to change this relationship into something more Productive, something more within our interest. That's what we want to. Do. Uh, 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 that's what we want to do. And if it takes, uh, you know, if it if it takes uh, 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 an intermediary, um, someone from a third country, or if it takes someone going on a, you know, on a on a, on a quiet mission uh, somewhere, or if it's by public statements, you know, if it's uh, Sadat to Jerusalem. You know, public statement, that kind of thing. Um, you know, any of that can, uh, you know, um, any of that can work. But um, any of that, I would say, you know, any of that can get us to a better place than we are now, or we've been on the where, where we've been very close to open warfare several times. Something that is not in the interest of either side. So there was another question, John, about if you were in the White House with President Biden. What executive action would you recommend first to reverse some of the anti-Iranian policies of the Trump administration? Which one would you do first in terms of executive orders? Well, I haven't had any calls like that, Bahman. Uh, so the, you know, the phone hasn't been ringing off the uh, ringing off the hook. Um, you know, someone mentioned these. I, I you know, the, obviously the travel ban. Uh, would be a good start, you know. Would would be a good start because um, it, it really puts the lie to all of these claims about how much we love the Iranian people uh, and how much we, you know, how much we want good things for the, uh, 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 their prosperity. I mean, the idea that uh, it, you, we are somehow safer because someone's grandparents cannot come to the United uh, cannot come and visit. Uh, to, to the United States, or some student cannot come here to study, um, to me ring pretty false. Uh, uh, ring pretty false. So that might be a good place. To, that might be a good place to start. There are obviously a lot of others, but that certainly. And then to make a more uh, in in re, in relation to the travel ban, also to uh, to make a more humane uh, humane visa policy, so that um, getting a uh, getting a visa. Uh, does not become uh, so difficult, so complicated, and so expensive as, as it is now. Will the other side reciprocate? Um, I don't know. Uh, can't say they will. You know, I, uh, 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 I can't say they will. But there are certain the, there are certain actions uh, that I think carry their own benefits. You know, unilaterally carry their own benefits unilaterally. 
Yes. Yes. Go ahead, Matt. <clears throat> um, just to swing back around to a, a bit more of a historical question. Um, I, this is uh, addressing a few of the questions that have been asked and something that I am wondering myself. Um, are the issues that we're dealing with, uh, you, your initial talks presented them as very much post-79 issues and an anomalous situation um, when we kind of compare the post-79 situation to the, the long durée. Um, are there any issues that predate 1979 that continue to remain relevant today? Are there deep systemat you know, systemic questions and uh, issues that are inherent to U.S.-Iran relations that um, you know, uh, matter uh, regardless of uh, the government or the administration in power on oil pr prices and human rights and the nature of leadership in both countries and debates about realism versus idealism in U.S. foreign policy. Um, are there are there deep systemic issues that you would identify or uh, would you um, kind of would we be best served by thinking about um, kind of this post 79 uh, uh, anomaly in a unique situation when compared to a longer history? Uh, uh, well, I'll just tell you a story uh, uh, about uh, eight or nine years ago. Um, I was on a Voice America Persian Persian language service program, and that was that was in the previous administration when they still invited me to come and speak, uh, uh, to, to come and speak. I haven't been welcome there for a few years, for a few years now, but, uh, and I was there and it was a, it was a, a, a call-in show. Uh, and the, we were talking about recent events and then we talked about the hostage crisis and so forth and so on. And someone called in from Iran, I think, and said, uh, you know, uh, it's. I'm very sorry for what happened, you know, to you and your colleagues. But you know, it's been 30 years now. Um, isn't it time that we moved on from that? And I said, um, Sir, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I think it is. But let me ask you one question: Are you ready to do the same with the events of 1953 um, and the overthrow of uh, of, of Mossadegh by the Americans and the British? His answer was never, <laughs> never move on. No, won't forget, won't forget. Now, that's not to suggest they're they're equal or parallel. They're not. They're not the same. They're 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 not the same kind of, uh, not the same kind of uh, same kind of event. Uh, but they're out there. I call them in in my the negotiation book that um, you uh, most kindly mentioned earlier. Uh, I call them the ghosts of history. Um, and they're there, um, and you know if you don't uh, if you don't deal with a ghost, if you don't acknowledge a ghost, um, it comes back to haunt you. Uh, and they the ghosts of fifty three um, in nineteen seventy nine, when President Carter was considering whether to admit the Shah, the ailing Shah. To Iran, uh, uh, to Iran, uh, that ghost of '53 was in the room. They didn't acknowledge it. Uh, they didn't realize it was there, uh, but it was there, uh, and it gave them one hell of a haunting. Yes. Do you, Do you think that the release of the new State Department Foreign Relations of the United States volume on the coup and this kind of larger phenomenon of declassification diplomacy, which we've seen with U.S. Iran and the United States and various Latin American countries, does that um, help um, uh, get the ghosts out of the room or uh, d does it not uh, help in the grand scheme of things? Oh, sure it does. But I mean, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've criticized the Iranians, uh, Iranian side for not coming to terms with with 79 uh, and pretending that, you know, pretending that it never happened. I, I, I often say that uh, they, they, it's like, um, it's like Star Wars. It happened a long time ago in a galaxy far away. Um, but, you know, you can say, oh, you know, what, what's that about? But, you know, that was 40 years ago. It took us, how long does it take us to come to terms with 
um, the events of 53, well, it took, what, 60, 70 years before those documents came out. Um, our British cousins, um, I don't think they've even, they've, they, they still haven't brought them out. And I think bringing the ones out, um, bringing out the American ones was like pulling teeth. Um, to get the, uh, my, my my friends who were involved in this, uh, that it was like pulling teeth to get to get these uh, to get the CIA to after sixty or seventy which was sixty or seventy years to finally come uh, come clean um, about what had uh, uh, what had happened. Oh no, it's still there. It's still it's it's still there. But again, at some time um, you have to get these things out um, because if you ignore them. Uh, if you ignore if you ignore these past events, they 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 don't go away. Right. So, John, thank you so much. I want to give you a couple of minutes of concluding uh, remarks. If you like to kind of uh, summarize any points that you would like uh, to bring up, questions because now we've been subject to you to questions. So, uh, we wanted to conclude with you summarizing some of your questions that you have for future conversations on Iran and the United States and what type of uh, lessons do you see for new diplomats arriving on the scene and others who have to be dealing with Iran? Well, thank you, Bahman, and thank you, Matt, and thank the audience for, uh, uh, thank you for your attention and for the excellent questions uh, that, you, uh, uh, that you posed. Uh, I mean, it's obvious that uh, you know, Iran isn't going isn't going to go away. Um, we've, you know, many administ administ American administrations have tried uh, have tried different things. I mean, the, the first Bush administration it was goodwill begets good uh, uh, goodwill begets goodwill. Uh, we've heard about dual containment. We've heard about axis of evil. We've heard about uh, um, axis of evil. Um, uh, and um, and all of these things. Uh, again, you know what has worked? Well, not much. Uh, not much out. Uh, not much out uh, out of this. Uh, but the reality is, many many when it, many administrations, and I, I don't think it's going to be true with this administration. But many administrations have come in saying, uh, "Oh, we don't want to have anything to do with Iran." Because uh, you know, look what Iran did to this the previous administrations. Look, look at all the trouble that they had, and look, look at Iran, look at uh, Iran Contra, and look at the hostage uh, hostage crisis. But you know, it was a, um, I think it was a, a, a another New Yorker. I, I I live in New York now, and I another fellow New Yorker by the name of Leon Trotsky. Uh, who once said uh, he said you know he said you may have no business with war, but War has business with you, and Iran is a little bit the same way. We may have, we may want to have no business with Iran, but Iran has business with us, um, and we have to deal. We we have to deal. We have to deal with it. And as I said, dealing. Um, I much prefer smart uh, to any of the alternative uh, uh, to any of the alternatives. And I will just end with this. Um, and think about, I'd ask to leave the audience with this thought. Um, what happens when uh, two parties, whether it's family members, friend, uh, acquaintances, neighbors, or countries, uh, remain estranged for a long time? And I would say the following that uh, the, the two parties become, in, the, in, 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 in each other's view, uh, simultaneously superhuman and subhuman. So we see the other side as uh, superhuman in the fact it's capable of doing anything. You know, the United States is capable of overthrowing the Islamic Republic with a push of a button or a few computer, uh, uh, a few computer strokes. Um, the Islamic Republic is capable of building missiles 
um, that will hit anywhere in the world, or it's capable of building a nuclear weapon tomorrow, or it's capable of sending, um, sending its Navy to the South Atlantic or to the coast of Florida or wherever, superhuman. Uh, and the subhuman means, the subhuman means not constrained by any consideration of morality, uh, decency, huma or humanity, or religion, or whatever, well, uh, whatever con constraints there might be. In other words, the superhuman is capable of doing anything. The subhuman says it's willing to do anything. And that's the way, unfortunately, that has come to be, I think, the way we, uh, we see each other. And when you see the other side as superhuman, of course, you fear it. Um, and we do, you know, you, you read about, you read nonsense about the new Persian empire, for example, expanding its, uh, expanding its reach, God knows, God knows where. Um, the subhuman, we not only fear, but we despise. And when we despise it, uh, we're capable of doing anything. I mean, we're, we're justified. In doing anything, meaning to you know to to starve it, to bomb it, or to do what whatever is uh, uh, whatever is possible, and what my uh, my fear has always been that this long estrangement has led us into a situation where we that's the way we that's the way we see each other. So my own desire, and I'm uh, you know I'm at a, at a well past age now. I would be working, but I hope, you know, while I'm still here, that I see that some break in that development and that our views, views of each other go, uh, go in a different direction. Thank you very much, John, for that conclusion. And I want to also thank Matt for his moderation and summary of all the questions, his knowledge of American-Iranian relations uh, and his publications on the subject is quite helpful to our Institute's mission. So our next uh, speaker is Professor David Manashri from Tel Aviv University. Uh, we're gonna be addressing the same issues about how Iran and Israel went from a close friendship to bitter enemies and how that conflict from friendship to conflict today is impacting the relations, not just between Iran and the region, but also between Iran and United States. So please join us for that next event. And again, I wanna thank Ambassador Limbert for taking time to participate in our first conversation series. Uh, here at the Baskerville Institute, we, we plan to continue these conversations, both historical and current. And uh, in late February, we have a speaker on Morgan Schuster. And in March, we have Professor Michael Zerinsky on missionaries in Iran. And in April, the anniversary of the Howard C. Baskerville's death and martyrdom in Iran, we have a panel on Howard Baskerville, and we are going to have a speaker from Urumia University who has been writing on Baskerville, and we're going to have a joint panel between an Iranian expert of Baskerville and an American expert of Baskerville to see how the mutual perceptions are going. Well, thank you again very much, and uh, Please check our website for future uh, events and everything. And John, thank you so much. And my best regards to Parvana John and the family. And we all hope for a better future between Iran and US. Thank you, Brad. thank you, Batman. Thank you, Matt. And uh, thanks to the audience for, for, for such for great questions. Thank you. Thank you, Matt.